Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in our study of the book of Acts, and we're going to start today with uh, chapter 12. Surprisingly, uh, yesterday we were actually got through one entire chapter. The entire chapter 11 uh, was completed yesterday. Uh, but if, if you have not seen all the previous studies we've done on Acts, starting with Acts chapter 1, verse 1, all the way up to now we're on chapter 12, I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. It, it's just going to be so helpful if you will watch it all. Um, but today, uh, we're about to get started before, so we do, though, let's introduce the, um, Brother Joe and Brother Ted. Would you say hi to everybody? Yeah, I'll go ahead. This is Ted from uh, the channel God's Truth Ministries, and uh, some videos on there for you about uh, the great gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and some videos there to encourage and edify other Christians. I hope you guys will stick with us today in this study of Acts. Uh, this is uh, a wild ride, but it's a fun ride. Uh, wasn't so fun for the Christians back then, but uh, when we look at their persecutions and what they went through in light of what we go through, it's what we go through is very, very mild. So we can be thankful and we can look to them for, for courage and encouragement uh, in this study. So I hope you guys will stick with us. Thanks. Back to you, brother. All right. Good. Brother Joe. Yeah, this is Joe from uh, the Sebastian Dresden channel, a channel for learning and uh, fellowship. And this, this uh, chapter of Acts uh, chronicles the, beginning of the church, uh, and so it, it's really fascinating, and I, I do hope you'll uh, uh, stick with us. All right, thank you. Well, I'm going to try to summarize the ground we've covered in, in like maybe 30 seconds here real quickly. Uh, uh, the, the Acts begins in chapter 1 with Pentecost, uh, where uh, the uh, Holy Spirit comes into the, the believers. The church officially begins at this point. That's my position. Uh, and then uh, the next uh, one of the Peter starts preaching. Uh, I mean, of course, John and the apostles are with him, but Peter starts preaching publicly, and thousands and thousands of people are becoming believers. Peter, in all of his messages, he's preaching the gospel just as we know it today uh, the death, burial, re resurrection of Jesus Christ, faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins. Is, and that's how you get salvation. And, and so um, that's been done. And then about three and a half years after Pentecost, we have Stephen martyred. And then shortly after that, um, I think maybe about uh, three years after that, uh, two years after that maybe, uh, Saul of Tarsus gets converted and becomes uh, a believer. Uh, and, and then we have Peter preaching to, uh, God tells him to go preach to uh, Cornelius and his family, Gentiles. Gentiles now are believers, and then the church is shocked. They don't expect Gentiles to be part of it. Peter's confronted over this. He explains that God told him to do it and that they believe on Jesus just as they did. And uh, so now the church is uh, Jew and Gentile, uh, and Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem up to uh Antioch, and then he, he goes up and gets the Apostle Paul, uh, I mean Saul of Tarsus, he, he's not known as the Apostle Paul yet, and he's still called Saul. He goes and gets Saul from Tarsus, and they're joined together, and that's where we uh, left off last time. So let's begin now, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 in the KJV. Now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Uh, then were the days of unleavened bread. Let's stop there after verse 3. Uh, you guys decide who's going first today. I guess I'll go first. Uh, I think Joe went first yesterday. Is that right? That's right. Okay, I guess we're, t we're taking turns here. You know, when, when we go here into chapter 12 and really all through the book of Acts, we look at the persecution, and most of it, most of it happened from the Jews now, uh, 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 and from the religious leaders uh, of the Jews, but 
you know, this starting out in verse one says, "Now about that time, Herod the king uh, stretched forth his hands to uh, vex or harass certain people of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword." And you know, he saw it advantageous for political reasons. And and I just look at that, and you know, you have to look at what what evil leaders can do to a nation. I mean, Proverbs. I've gone through Proverbs much in the last year or two. Uh, you know, there's if you if you look at it, there's a proverb for every day. You know, you could read a proverb every day of the month and just start over, and that's a good thing to do. And I, I advise anybody to do that because there's so much wisdom in there, and a lot in there is about how. You know, uh, when there's when there's righteous leaders and when there's at least good wise leaders, the people can rejoice and be at peace. And when they're not, when there's not uh, righteous and just leaders, uh, the people, uh, you know, the people are in fear. The people are, are uh, harassed, and and uh, it's just it's just true here, especially for the cause of Christ. Um, and it's true, true in our world today. When you have evil leaders and evil, evil communist and socialist nations, and you know uh, that's what's happening here. Uh, you know, uh, righteous people don't rejoice in it at all. Uh, it's it's uh, it's bad. It, it impinges on the freedom of uh, individuals, and especially on religious freedoms. And that's what ha is happening here. And uh, I don't think we can just read over. Sometimes we read over in our King James English and or whatever we're reading, and he just and it just says, "And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword." I mean, imagine if it was your brother. Imagine if you were John, and uh, or, or the disciples that that knew James personally, and uh, a leader just had your brother or your loved one killed. I mean, we really have to put ourselves some time into the story, into what happened, and uh, so we can really uh, empathize and, and sympathize and relate and, uh, and, and put our heart in there. And uh, these, are, these are times of, of, of tremendous religious persecution. I know uh, Joe's much more of a historian. He can fill us in on, on what transpired during that, that first century persecution more than, more than Luke and I. But it's just a terrible, terrible thing. And it's going to happen again, folks. Uh, it's, it's going to happen again. We've been immune from it for so long, but it's coming. And uh, for political reasons, it advantageous to him. He says because it uh, pleased the Jews. Herod saw it pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to take Peter also. He says, oh, well, if they were patting me on the back politically for killing James, imagine what they'll do if I take Peter, kind of the, the head of this whole thing. Uh, so he's... Uh, uh, he's just really going to go on, on full assault, and I'll let Joe take over here because he's the historian of the bunch. So back to you, brother. Well, I'm, a, I'm an amateur uh, by most historian standards for sure, but I just remember things, so uh, you're, you're getting uh, probably good information. Uh, what I like, what I took from what you said, Ted, uh, is the most important thing is putting ourselves in their shoes I was sitting here considering the passages, and I didn't consider it in the way that you mentioned it until you said that. Yeah, imagine your job, and you're uh, living for Christ. You're showing love to your enemies. You're witnessing uh, to those who would uh, uh, have you uh, put down the Jews. And now they've taken your own brother who you grew up with. And if I'm not mistaken, James is an apostle. James, the brother of John, I think is an apostle, and Luke, correct me or, or Ted, if I'm wrong, this would be the first death or the first martyr of an apostle, if that's true. And so that's highly significant. One of the twelve has just now been slain. And uh, now keep in mind, I know why this happened. Uh, this is why the scripture mentioned Claudius a few verses back. And this is why it's significant, because... Uh, king Agrippa is not appointed king of the Jews by the Jews. He was a he's a Jew that was appointed as king as a political favor from the Caesars. Now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he was appointed king during the time of Julius Caesar when Christ was with us, and then uh, Caligula came to power. And extra biblical history tells us that that the political king, which was Agrippa here, 
was paying gold, <coughs> taking money from the Jewish coffers, even taking relics, sacred relics from the from the Jewish temple, and sending them to Caligula to appease him from putting his statue of worship into the, the, the holy temple, which would have been instant war. And so uh, Agrippa and the, the priesthood at the time were terribly afraid of doing anything to anger Caligula, because if they did, if they killed someone without his approval or his uh, governor's approval, uh, they could easily uh, be slaughtered. And so, uh, during the time of Caligula, the church was relatively safe. When they went to uh, slay Paul, they did it in the dead of night. They hid on a, on a road that was not well traveled. They it had to be secrecy. Well, Caligula is passed, and Scripture tells us a few verses ago, Claudius takes his place. Claudius has no uh, no acts against the Jews. He doesn't give a hoot about them one way or another. Uh, he's uh, uh, struggling, trying to keep his office because he has a epilepsy or something. And so now the, the Jews have an open hand or a free hand uh, without fear to attack the, the church again, without worrying about having authorization from Rome. And so uh, Agrippa, being a political appointee, he doesn't have a jail of his own. Everything he does is through Roman authority. And so he has Rome's ear, or the governor's ear, Pontius Pilate type authority. And so uh, uh, he is feeling free to, to make himself popular amongst those he rules over. And uh, he's heard the, you know, he has contact with the leaders of the temple, and he's doing their bidding and seeing that uh, he's being praised for it. So he's killed one apostle, now he's going for the, the, the rock star. He's going for the head apostle. And so this is, uh, this is scary stuff. Back to you. Hmm. Well, this is uh, roughly 47 AD. Uh, one thing I forgot to say in my, intro, my little summary uh, when I first started was uh, uh, I talked about the dates of these events, but when it came to um, the Gentiles, Cornelius and his family being converted, that was 10 years after Pentecost. And now, now we're uh, roughly uh, 47 AD, so it's probably like 14 years after Pentecost now. And well, as far as him being an apostle, yeah, uh, you had John, um, John and James were brothers. This is referring to, to James, the brother of John. They are both apostles. So this is the first record of one of the apostles being killed. Stephen was killed, of course, but he wasn't one of the original 12 apostles. Um, and, and and then, of course, we have the other brothers, or Peter and Andrew. But this James should not be confused with the James, the writer of the book of James, James, the uh, what they call the bishopric of of uh, of uh, the Jerusalem Church, the leader of the Jerusalem Church, was James. Most people think this is James, the brother of the Lord. Uh, I think it said, even says that in the in the scriptures. But um, so this is not. It's important to get that right. That this is not that James. This is the original apostle James. Um, so. Let me see if I've missed any of the main points there. Read it again. Uh, he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, then were the days of unleavened bread. Uh, I, that must be referencing a holiday. Let me look at that in the Amplified. This was during the days of unleavened bread, which is the, the Passover week. Okay. Um, all right, uh, before I go on, any other thoughts? All right, I'll read further then. Verse 4, and, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers uh, to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Uh, 
Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Uh, so that's verse uh, 4 and 5. I'll stop there. All right. Well, I mean, it just it just says what's uh, it's it seemed pretty obvious that he, that he didn't have to look very hard for Peter. The word doesn't tell us that he did. Uh, and obviously, it looks like Peter didn't know this was coming. He might have had some apprehension after what happened to James, certainly. But uh, nevertheless, Peter was found and put in prison and uh, delivered him to four quaternions. Quaternions, uh, I looked that up. Uh, here in my margin, it does say 16, so quad, that's obviously uh, four, four, four groups of four. So, <laughs> you know, uh, was Peter that uh, robust and intimidating that it takes 16 soldiers to, <laughs> to apprehend him and put him in prison? It's kind of like when we see sometimes uh, uh, police uh, overreaction, and I totally support our police, don't get me wrong, but sometimes you know that. 20 squad cars show up for, uh, you know, someone who's got a hangnail or something. I don't know. But anyways, uh, I'll get off. <laughs> but uh, intending, uh, and the King James says, after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And I'm sure you know this, Luke. Uh, this is a big, uh, people make a big hullabaloo about uh, this translation. The word is Pasha, uh, the same word for Passover. And, and for some reason, unbeknownst to us or to un not unknown to me, I don't know why they translated Pasha here as Easter, maybe just because a cultural thing uh, uh, of, of the 1600s uh, of calling it that. They, they didn't translate it this way elsewhere. I know the King James only is, uh, make a big deal that this is correct, and they go back and use the dates of things happening. Uh, and in the Old Testament about the, the that specific Passover, uh, of the days of unleavened bread that you talked about up there in verse 3, I don't know all those arguments. I don't, I don't want to get into that, but I, I just we have to throw it out there because someone will say we glossed over it. Uh, therefore, keep, uh, he, Peter there was kept in prison, but prayer was made, and this is the point I want to make. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God for him. Uh, so many people who, uh, in Christian circles, who have a, uh, well, let's just say their their predominant mindset is, uh, you know, one of, uh, you know, that God ordains all things and you know, uh, you know, sovereignty of God, sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God. Uh, sovereignty isn't even a word in the King James Bible. It's not even there. <laughs> and uh, sovereignty is only in the New King James once, or sovereign. And uh, that's talking about Saul in the Old Testament having power over all the people, a sovereign uh, uh, king over all the people. <laughs> so... Um, the point I want to make there about verse 5 is that these early saints and true Christians, uh, and you see this throughout all history, they believed in the power of prayer. They believed that prayer changed things. And, uh, you know, the, the Calvinists would say, God changeth not. He's never going to change his mind when he's sovereignly ordained. Really? Really? Have you, have you read the Bible? Uh, you might want to read Jonah. You might want to read uh, what happened with Hezekiah. I mean, over and over and over, I mean, Prayer, God heeds the prayer, and because of prayer, God answers something. Uh, God decided not to destroy the children of Israel because of Moses interceding for him. Uh, so, uh, and Moses had his had his flaws, warts and all. These people of God prayed and sought God for Peter. Uh, they made a decision to pray because prayer does change outcomes. Prayer, God does answer prayer. You ask not, or you have not, because he asked not. Ask, seek, knock. I, I, we have to hit this when we go through Acts, because these early Christians were not Calvinists. Uh, they were true Christians. Hey, how do you like that? True Christians as opposed to Calvinists. I'm not saying Calvinists aren't Christians, but uh, true to the Word, true to how God views prayer. I'll stop there. Back to you. <laughs> well, I, I like how Ted always puts a personal uh, bent on the Scripture. Uh, he, he's pointing out the one thing that I probably wouldn't have pointed out, and that's that the church began earnestly praying, uh, and and that is incredibly probably the most important point of all these verses. Uh, what I saw, uh, aside from that, uh, more technically, is that he uh, he's now killed one of the twelve, or had 
the death order. And now he's going after uh, the big fish, the head apostle. And you got to remember, right now, now this is years after there were that we know there were 50,000 converts. Uh, so the church is sizable in Jerusalem, some scattered, but also there's been growth. And so uh, it said that uh, in the Matthew Henry commentary that during Pentecost that about 250,000 uh, Jews uh, pilgrimed to Jerusalem, and there were about 80,000 Jews in Jerusalem that lived there. And so we're looking at back then about 300,000 to 350,000 Jews or Jews and Christians, whatever, uh, in Jerusalem for a, a big feast or a big uh, pilgrimage such as this one. Now Agrippa is trying to gain popularity uh, not because he uh, is so much against what they're doing. Uh, the king couldn't give a hoot what somebody believes. He's a political appointee. He's, he's uh, no friend of the Pharisees and the Sadducees any more than the Christians uh, in so, other than uh, exchanging favors. You know, he's been appointed by Caesar to this position. And so what he's trying to do is, is gain power, gain the favor of the people. He really has no ax to grind against Christ personally, I don't think. Remember when Christ was born, uh, I don't know if it, it was King Herod, wasn't it? This is Herod. I, I, I get him confused. The king at the time, if it's the same guy or not, I don't know, tried to have all the uh, Christian baby or the Christian baby, the uh, Jewish babies born killed uh, so that he didn't have to worry about some lineage of a king rising up and displacing him out of his comfortable position that he had been placed in by Rome. And so uh, he's, he's real uptight about the church in Jerusalem uh, revolting against him. That's why he's not just having Peter killed, he's having him brought before the people much the same way Christ was brought before the people. You know, he wants he wants uh, the, the people to uh, assure him that this is not going to be damaging to him. And so uh, this is a power play by the political appointee doing favors for the Pharisees and he's so worried about an uprising uh, that he's got 16 guards, and I assume Roman guards, in a Roman prison uh, assigned to Peter to make sure that he's not broken out or there's no insurrection to break him out. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, the, the word Easter is very interesting. Uh, many people I know uh, that I've, uh, I've gotten to know um, over the years that are what we would call radical Christians. Now, we're radical Christians in that, in that we, we don't just go to church occasionally or go to church once a week and that's when we think about Jesus and then, and then the rest of the week he's not on our mind. He's on our mind every day and, 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 and we want to have fellowship and talk about him every day and we're doing Bible studies and various things and, and this, is, this is unusual. Most Christians do not uh, spend this much time thinking about Jesus actually. It's, but when people become radical Christians, unfortunately most of the radical Christians I've met over the years personally and on YouTube, um, you think that being really a radical or on fire or passionate for Jesus would be a good thing, but they end up be, becoming uh, really uh, difficult in a lot of ways. And actually, many of them, they want to, they say they want to bring people to Jesus, but they're repelling them away because they're, they're so extreme that it turns people off and, you know, they're, their, uh, their message is either tainted or their attitude is, 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 is too extreme and not attractive to people, sometimes just downright uh, mean-spirited. And so that's, the reason I'm making this point is that the, the people like that, that many of the people I know would really object to this word Easter. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, I don't have any problem with it. I've never really studied to find the origin of the word Easter. Actually, it's a little bit surprising. I don't even remember it being in in this 
in the Bible. Um, obviously, I've read this book many times, but I just don't remember the word Easter being there. I'm sure that it wasn't. It wasn't this Mandela effect that everybody's worried about now. And now, now it's changed, and the Easter is there. But no, it, it's been there. But I just didn't really uh, pay much attention, I guess. Um, but the, the word Easter is very upsetting to these radical Christians because they think it's a pagan word, a pagan idea, taken from some kind of pagan religion. And maybe, maybe it was. I don't know. But uh, it bothers. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't. It doesn't um, diminish the the KJV translators, to, in my opinion, because they use the word Easter. Um, but it's just another thing for people to get upset and argue about. And um, now, the let me see the other point that you made. I forgot what it was. Let me see if I can remember here. Um, Oh yeah, you were talking about Herod. I just want to, I think I can correct you, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm like 90% sure about this. The Herod that you referenced with uh, ordering the, the murdering of the babies uh, was not the same Herod that Jesus appeared before when he went to Pontius Pilate and then Pontius Pilate sent to Herod. Different Herods. It's, uh, the first one is the father of this, the second one. So the Herod that we're referencing now would be the second one, the one that Jesus appeared to, and the, the one that mocked Jesus and sent it back to to, to Pilate. Um, so that's that's all I would all I have to say. Anything else before we move on? Okay. Just, 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 just a quick note on Easter. While you were uh, talking about that, of course it comes from the. Uh, so they say it comes from Ishtar, but it, that's irrelevant. I was just going to recount a, a story that I remembered. Uh, I was at a, at a wedding ceremony, and uh, I was friends with a priest. And 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 uh, this priest, Mike, he went up to uh, one of the one of the people at the wedding, and he said, "Alex, it's so good to see you." And it, and Alex said, "Oh, it's good to see you too, uh, Father Mike." And he said, "Am I going to see you at mass next week?" And and Alex looked at him with the most panicked look. Is is it Easter again? Is it Easter next Sunday? <laughs> he goes to church once a year. Anyway, I thought it was humorous, but uh, true story. All right, you're forcing me to talk more about Easter now. That uh, uh, you know, I remember when I first got involved in church, and immediately I got very busy in the church. It, it became a real serious thing for me right away. And I know I remember the term one of the pastors. We always refer to the the typical person is the C and E people. The Christ they come Christmas and Easter. So some people they think about Jesus twice a year. And then there's another group of people they think about Jesus once a week. And um, you know we we think about Jesus every day. And uh, I'm not trying to boast that we're better than other people, but um, and I don't I, I don't I don't I can't explain why. But I love to talk about Jesus. So you can place whatever judgment you want on that. But I wish everybody would be thinking about Jesus all the time. But the word Easter to me, I don't use it. And it's not. And as I just got through saying, I don't object to being in the KJV translation. But personally, I don't use the word Easter. I call it Resurrection Day. Um, now, uh, uh, but I don't celebrate. Resurrection Day. I don't celebrate Christmas or the birth of Jesus. I, I don't celebrate that day. You know why? It's not because I'm, I think it's wrong to celebrate holidays. It's because I'm busy celebrating the birth, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus every day. I, there's no distinction. And every day is Christmas and Easter to me in terms of my my thought is on Jesus. And uh, I'm I'm afraid I'm afraid that some people are going to interpret this as I'm coming off as as a haughty or something, but I'm just trying to explain how I see the word Easter and all this. All right, let me move on before I put pit myself even more in a corner. Um, all right, verse six, and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison, 
and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon Peter. I'm sorry, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Go ahead. <laughs> wow, brother, there's a lot in there. Uh, just that, uh, just the fact that this kind of happens right under the wire. We're not. I don't know if we're told uh, how many days or how long uh, that Peter was in there, but. Herod would have would have brought him forth, you know, you know, at, at an appointed time. Herod had decided, you know, and there that there's Peter between two soldiers, bound with not one but two chains. I mean, you're in prison and you're chained up. Wow. I mean, they must have been really uh, not so uh, not having much faith in the doors and <laughs> and the guards. I mean, goodness gracious, the keepers uh, in front of the door kept the prison. Behold. Uh, verse 7, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the uh, cell, in the prison there. And he hit, he smote Peter on the side. <laughs> Peter must not have uh, been, uh, Peter certainly wasn't a light sleeper. The angel had to hit him on the side, looks like. <laughs> Raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. His chains fell off from his hands. So so this is a true miracle. This is, this is just miraculous things that we're going to see happen throughout the book of Acts, on and off, all the time. And, uh, angel, gird thyself, bind on thy sandals, you know, uh, you know, get dressed, get your shoes on, get your act together, Peter. And so he did. So I wonder how long it took, you know, <laughs> Peter uh, stumbling around there. Uh, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And what amazes me is that he, he went out and followed him, followed the angel, and it says, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angels, but thought it was a vision. Peter's there dressed and walking and thinking, uh, is this really happening? Is this a vision or is this a dream? Am I just having a dream? Uh, I guess we got to put ourselves in, in his position in, in that time of, of weakness and persecution uh, amidst all the miracles because he's walking out awake, at least halfway, and still doesn't realize whether this is reality or not. Amazing stuff. Back to you. Yeah, the, the first the first thing that I'd note is how neat it must be to have uh, uh, an experience like that. You know, I, I've talked to people, or I've known people who I trust, who have had legitimate uh, uh, encounters with God that would constitute what we would say be a vision or uh, uh, something like that, a trance maybe, I, I'm not sure. But evidently it's it's so uh, transformational and, and realistic or whatever that, like John said, I don't know if I was in my body or out of my body. You know, I just know that I was seeing this and feeling this. Man, I would love to experience that kind of thing someday. I've had a, a dream once that seems so real, you know, I guess we all have. but. Uh, yeah, this is this is a this would be a, a great experience trying to look at it like Ted does, you know, from from a, a point of view of their their mind level. Extraordinary. What what caught my attention here, and I don't want to uh, uh, address this, but I do want to note this. The 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 angel slapped him. <laughs> it didn't say that he shook him or he tapped him. It, it, it's it said that he, he smote him. That's a that's a hit or a slap, and he's like, hurry, let's go, move it. The chains fell. Get dressed. Do this. Let's go. It leads me to believe, and this is what I don't want to address, but do want to note, there was a contrary force here. There's a contrary effort at play that the angel required him to be of haste. Now, I don't know if the, it says that God uses the angels and, and we humans in a direct uh, way 
to be not just be his messengers, but to carry out his will. And there are contrary forces at work, both in the seen and unseen world. I remember Michael was delayed for three days or three weeks or three months, I forget, trying to get somewhere because he was fighting with and fallen angels to accomplish God's will. Now, God didn't have to let that happen. He didn't have to have Michael waylaid. He didn't have to have this angel that was uh, visiting Peter hurry, do this, slap the guy, let's get going, we got to hurry. It's There were contrary uh, works here. There were, there were uh, forces at work that sought to stop the angel from accomplishing his mission. And I, that to me is super fascinating. And I don't think anyone much dwell gets into it because there's no information on it. So it's all speculation. But I find that to be fascinating. Back to you. Well, there's a lot of things about this that really would strike me and probably strike anybody as it's, it's, it's a little odd, it's weird. But um, first, let me. You cited uh, someone else. Uh, they had a. They didn't know something was real or a vision. I. I, I you said John. I think you're referencing uh, Paul. And, but, Paul, but the way Paul stated was, I knew a man, and he went up to heaven. And whether in the body or out of the body, I know not. But I think Paul was. He was talking about himself. But the way he phrased it, uh, he, it was was odd. But it's another example of, of uh, something happening. And then Paul and now Peter, not understanding, is this real or is this a vision or, or what? John, John and the Isle of Patmos. Well, you'll have to show me where that is. I, I know that the story with Paul uh, and uh, when he went up to the third heaven, that's what I'm thinking of. If you think if John did, if it says the same thing about John, then uh, uh, show me. I'd like to see it. I'm not quite, ch I'm not challenging. I just don't remember it. Um, but uh, the other things about this that seem, it just seems so odd for the whole thing. Uh, um, I'm going to read it in the um, Amplified just to see if it, how they phrase it. First, starting with verse 6. The very night before Herod was to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. So I mean, th this is... Uh, this is the highest type of security. It's, he's not just in a jail or left alone with the door locked. Two soldiers are there right alongside of him. Uh, it's, it seems to me that they were taking every precaution. Uh, I'm surprised that it doesn't say the soldiers were chained to him. And maybe that was the case too. I don't know. But uh, uh, bound with two chains and sent. Maybe it does mean that. Peter was sleeping between soldiers bound with two chains. So maybe he was even bound to the soldiers. And sentries were in front of the door guarding the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord. Now, when it, the term angel of the Lord, sometimes this is referring to an appearance of, of, of God himself. Uh, we talked about that previously. And, and these, this um, thing is what's referred to as either a theophany or a Christophany, where God appears to men. So... Whether this is a theophany or whether it's just God sending an angel, uh, I, I don't know. Um, the Lord appeared beside him, and a light shone in the cell. So the light's on, and, and it seemed like they'd wake up. Uh, but what I don't understand about this is I'm certainly God, you know, with all his <laughs> unlimited abilities and powers. He could just make sure everybody just stays in a trance, in a sleep state, and doesn't wake. And um, I don't understand the concern that, uh, get out of here quickly. Uh, the angel struck Peter's side and awakened him, um, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. The angel said, prepare yourself and strap on your sandals to get ready for whatever may happen. And he did so. Then the angel told him, put on your robe and follow me. And Peter went out following the angel. Uh, he did not realize that he was being done. He, he did not realize that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. So it's phrased a, a little bit differently. Um, I don't really see any. Uh, didn't learn a whole lot more from reading it in the Amplified, but easy to understand. 
Um, all right, I guess before we go on, any more thoughts? Okay, let me go on then. Go, go back to the the KJV. Uh, uh, when, when verse ten, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Um, let, me, let me stop there. Well, the thing I'm seeing there is that they just, uh, obviously, their, their, their presence was, was obviously hidden from the guard posts. From, uh, this was to, truly had to be a divine act of God, either, like you said, Luke, maybe the guards were put into a trance and their vision uh, obscured to where they, they couldn't see Peter the angel, uh, or they just became... Uh, you know, I, I don't know, invisible? I don't know. Uh, I don't think we're told. I think we can read between the lines, but uh, obviously it's kind of reminds me of uh, a couple of the instances in in, uh, in Jesus' earthly, earthly ministry where, you know, it says they would have stoned him, but he just passed through the crowd. It's like they didn't even see him. Their eyes were withheld from seeing Christ, whether that means he became invisible or uh, God obscured their conscience and their vision to be able to see, but I think it's the same thing here. We're not told exactly how they were blinded, how they were not seeing Peter and the angel, but uh, this is this is truly miraculous. I have, I have no more explanation for that one verse other than that. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to what, what you said, Ted. I, I will say that I see everything as an action-adventure movie, and uh, because of the haste that was made and uh, the urgency of the moment, I'm going to assume it was not a, a, a theophany or Christophany, that it was an angelic uh, being that uh, had contrary forces at work. Otherwise, there would have not been any of that. And so I think there were demonic or uh, fallen angel elements at play here, and they were, they were literally uh, having a, a spiritual warfare moment that we know nothing about, and we simply see what Peter saw, and that's a need for haste and following orders and getting the heck out of there the angel accompanies him, uh, even through the gate. So uh, it wasn't just make your way, walk out. It was uh, it was much more complicated than that. I had one more thing on that, Luke. The thing is, it says, uh, when they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, it opened to them of its own accord. So they didn't even have to open it. Just The gate just opened for them. So this is miracle after miracle after miracle, a series of miracles with this within this one miraculous event of freeing Peter. The iron gate of the city just opens up for them. I mean, how do you like that? Amazing stuff. You either believe it or you don't, folks. Yeah. Well, you, you, you both seem to think that there's some opposing force at work here that, that to... Uh, in your explanation, that I don't see it. I don't. I don't see how you you come up with that. I mean, I, I hear you. I'm not saying there's not, but I just don't see that in the in the context at all. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't conclude that. Um, I just think it's just a simple matter that doesn't want to wake wake them up and create vigorous scene than necessary. But I was going to comment about that gate also, since uh, I don't want to say anything, but. Ted had to say, let me have another turn. I forgot to tell you about the gate. It was just a wonderful thing that this big, heavy gate just opened up before them with no effort on their part. All right, let me go on. Um, verse 11, and when Peter was come to himself,
Joe, I can't hear you. Can't, I, can't, uh, I, just, I just heard you for the first time. Can you hear me? I hear you. I hear you. Okay, we, I, you were, the whole thing was uh, no audio, Luke or you, and I went and, and signed back on like you did, no, and my no. audio just now came back on. Did, did you lose audio also, Ted? Yeah, I did. First I lost, I guess, connection, and then when I came back, I had no audio from Luke. Yeah, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. It was me, too, so that means it was the system. Okay. Now, it seems like Luke uh, is not with us because I'm not getting any feedback while his mic is on. Maybe he's still reading or something and doesn't even know it went away. I don't know. Uh, I put in the side chat bar that uh, that I had lost audio and that you had dropped off. So uh, he might be having, he needs to maybe restart his system also, seeing as how both of ours went chaotic. And Luke says I am here on the sidebar. But Luke, can you say something to see if we can hear you? Luke, you don't have audio. You're going to have to sign back on to, to the Hangout. Uh, that's how I got my audio back, and I assume Ted also. Yeah, that's how I got mine back. I, I signed off and came back, re rebooted the link. Me too. Uh, uh, right on the sidebar, Luke, if you have to sign back on, are we going to lose the Hangout? 